Welcome to Inspiring STEM's podcast program discussing innovations in scientific publishing and science communications. We are interviewing key opinion leaders and organizations working to advance and quite often to disrupt the status quo. My name is Martin Delhanty and I will be your host. In this episode, I'm meeting with Cameron Robert Carden, founder and CEO at Knowledge, along with Knowledge's head of publishing, Emily Chownowski. Cameron founded Knowledge in 2012 with the aim of providing unique, professional and high serv services, high quality services to the information professionals in the Middle East region. Uh, Cameron also plays an active role in the Knowledge Foundation, a community interest corporation focusing on supporting education and research-based projects across the globe with a focus on developing nations. Emily is Head of Research Development and Dissemination at Knowledge and Director of Operations for the Forum for Open Research in MENA, which we will talk about a little bit later. Welcome back, Cameron and Emily, to the program. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Matt. Thanks for having us again. To begin with, uh, it's a pleasure having you back, and time has moved on quickly. But I know we've we've uh, you've a lot has happened on on your side, so it'll be good to to catch up with it. So maybe to begin with, you could you could tell us generally how things are going with Knowledge E. Well, definitely uh, busy as ever. Uh, there's no quiet period, uh, as you can imagine, with all the different projects uh, uh, going around. Uh, it's we're in our 11th year since inception so it's like really an exciting time to see a lot of the the ideas and and, and, and the plans that we had from the beginning to to finally take shape and uh, end up in being projects and products that are not just serving a regional community but a global community so it's definitely exciting times and uh, everyone within the company is busy with either a project or a product or a service, so um, it's 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 a good place to be. Good. <laughs> and when when we met last year, we were in the midst of planning for the the first forum for open research in MENA. As you have now announced the second annual forum, I can only assume that the first was a great success. So maybe you could share with us your experience from last year and what's what's planned for this year. Um, yeah, I mean it was not to blow our own trumpets, but we think it went quite well, all things considered. Um, it was the first massive event we've ever done as a, as a company, as an organization. Um, and I think it was it was a really great uh, flagship event for the Knowledge E Foundation, which is the charitable branch of the company, um, to really start to engage with what is arguably one of the most pressing issues for the academic ecosystem globally, and specifically one that has historically perhaps lacked development in, in many research communities and research institutions in this region. So in the end, we, we held the event in Cairo. Um, there was a, a free kale storm at one point, a little unexpected and flooding. <laughs> so the elements were certainly against us, but we still had, we had a huge number of delegates attend online and in person. Overall, we had almost 1,200 delegates from 48 countries across the world. We had a series of really, really excellent papers and presentations from 50 speakers, you know, librarians from across the region, researchers and policymakers within the region, but also um, leading open science champions and, and open science nonprofit providers from across the world coming and sharing the benefits of their insights. And I think what was really great about the event and what came across during the event itself and in the responses afterwards was how much the audience who was there at the time and those who have been accessing the recordings and the Zenodo presentations afterwards really valued the, the emphasis on practical insights, actionable policies, things, information that people could take away. People were sharing case studies of what they've done in the region and, and globally in a way that other people could learn from. Because it's not just, I think, about the success stories, the challenges that people haven't been able to overcome and sometimes the failures have actually proved as beneficial for for the community um, as success stories because people have had a chance to learn what not to waste their time on and what not to do which is, is, is very useful we like learning from other people's mistakes so after that and we did go ahead um, with the event and the event was successful so building on that this year we're now um, taking off we've got the 2023 annual forum coming up in October which uh, will be here in Abu Dhabi this year 
makes our lives slightly easier not being overseas from an administrative perspective. But also it means we're, we're really able to, to leverage our, our network within um, the UAE. Uh, we're, we're particularly excited to have the Minister of Education is going to be giving one of our keynotes, um, which is which is hugely important, obviously, to get that senior policymaker endorsement to further the uh, cause of, of open science. But we are also fully partnering with UNESCO this year. Uh, before they were just endorsing us this year, they're a, they're a full partner of the event, which again is is been invaluable for us. And I think will really bear fruit because that's enabled us to really tap into that high level policy making uh, category and bring in. We're hoping to bring in some some key regional uh, strategy discussions into the event. So we're having a, a moderated strategic panel for some of the big organizations from a region focusing on higher education. So um, the Arab States Research and Education Network, the Arab Universities Association, and various other organizations like that are gonna come in and, and weigh in and help us both broaden the discussion, I think, to across all 22 Arab states, but also really try and establish a roadmap for the development of open science in the future. Because it's not just about the standalone event, it is about the broader goals. Um, and so we are also in the process um, as part of the Knowledge Foundation of establishing a, a separate independent initiative as the Forum for Open Research, which will help to drive, we hope, um, the sort of development and implementation of open science policies and practices in research institutions and research communities across all 22 Arab states. Uh, and that's been a key part of what we've been doing over the course of this year. So it's not just focusing on the annual forum, but building that grassroots community um, and engagement across the region with a series of community development activities. We've had a, a series of small free online events and larger events uh, collaborating with the International Science Council, with nonprofits like the Directory of Open Access Journals, Crossref, ORCID, PKP, uh, Coalition S. Um, it's a huge roster of uh, really great collaborative partners and we're already planning the 2024 program as well which looks to be even better so it's but gathering traction which is nice and there's a huge appetite i think for the open science support network that perhaps hitherto the the region hasn't had whereas other regions obviously europe is a case in point they have a huge huge network of resources and stakeholders and guidance frameworks that we've historically lacked so it's good to sort of get the ball rolling on that here so uh, that's uh, you know amazing work uh, from last year to this year, and obviously involving UNESCO is is incredibly impressive. So, uh, what would you like to see from other international partners in terms of support? You mentioned DOAJ supporting you and other organisations, but what would you like to see more from uh, international stakeholders in supporting open science in the MENA region? To be honest, a lot of it, I think, is knowledge sharing. It's it's one of the nicest things working in the sector, and I know Cameron agrees with me. Is everyone's so open and sharing? You know, it's it's never a it's it's you don't operate in a silo. It's it's not competitive. It's not exclusionary. Everyone's working together. Every time we reach out to another organisation and say this is what we're doing, would you like to help? Would you like to support us? People have been incredibly supportive. The Director of Open Access Journals and PKP and Coalition S are actually all now our official strategic partners, um, which is is wonderful. And they're always sharing the benefit of their insights. And in return, we share resources, we introduce them to the network, give them a chance to discuss the key themes that matter to them, and also down into sort of basic nuts and bolts. We have Arabic translators and we're busy, you know, working on, mm -hmm. on portfolios mm -hmm. and things like that. So mm -hmm. they can then share um, in those resources. And I think that's one of the nicest things about what we're doing is I hate the phrase, oh, it's for the greater good. But it is it does really feel like that, like everyone is working towards a common goal. And I mean, other than that, we'd always like more partners. That would be nice. Um, mm -hmm. But certainly our, our existing partners are being hugely supportive with with knowledge um, more than anything else, but also with, with sort of guidance and advice and helping us broaden our own network by directing us if we need a particular person skill set, they'll everyone, everyone knows someone who can help that kind of thing. And I think everyone's very generous with their time in that regard. Mm. Yeah, so I assume Cameron, you're equally this, happy this is... with how the forum's going? Yeah, just, just to add, it's, uh, as Emily mentioned, this is uh, never a a single organization's task and it could be done only through collaboration and working with various partners and stakeholders from around the world and 
basically the momentum that has been created so far has been fantastic. And uh, one of the reasons for that is that we've really tried to take action and and really work on area, work in areas that really are important and we can have tangible results. But this can only grow and get better by further collaboration and more uh, partners, providers uh, joining, supporting, and uh, so we can together uh, really make a change and make a difference in, in in this area within within the region. And of course, it's it's. Um, a platform for cross-regional collaboration uh, between different regions on a global scale. So there's a lot to uh, lot to learn for all of us. And I, I assume that during the conversations last year and the conversations bring coming up to to this year's second second forum, that uh, funding has been part of that discussion. How to to fund open science and open access publishing in the MENA region. So what 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 can you share to uh, to people about sort of that that aspect to the uh, un underwriting the cost of open science publishing? It's a very big question. Cameron, do you want to start? Or yeah, I can start. Uh, when it comes to any form of dissemination, uh, scholarly uh, communications and the dissemination of the. the results, there's definitely a cost involved. And that's an important point that you mentioned, Martin. So um, um, we're changing business models, we're changing where the funding comes from, but eventually, somewhere, somewhere, someone somewhere needs to uh, uh, cover the costs of, of, of the delivery, the, uh, the production of, of all this material. So um, hearing the various stakeholders by testing variable uh, 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 various business models uh, is is the only way that we can find a a solution to that. I, I don't think mm -hmm. it's a black and white scenario where, for example, either um, uh, pay to publish or pay to use would be the only um, scenarios. There's definitely definitely in different cases various uh, scenarios that can can work, as we're seeing, for example, in Diamond Open Access Publishing, where. Uh, someone is supporting uh, the, the, the cost of production. And it comes to all the different areas um, in, 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 in science creation and knowledge sharing. So the answer mm. is still not out there. The key is to have as many stakeholders involved as possible, working together mm. towards a common goal. And at the end of the day, the common goal uh, for open science is that sense of openness and reduce reduction of barriers in order to either accessing, using um, uh, that, that information or any part of any discovery when it comes to the, and, and, and building those platforms to, uh, to improve discoverability or improve accessibility. So uh, there's many uh, factors that go into it in order to to reach that common goal. Uh, but as mm -hmm. I said, the more stakeholders, the more involved, the more collaboration we have. And some sometimes you need to take bold steps in order to test new models. And I think on some uh, side of, uh, especially on the accessibility front, that's what we've done with uh, the other project we discussed uh, before, and that is the Zendi project. So that's yes. just one example of really uh, transforming the status, uh, changing the status quo and really being bold enough to try something new. So uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll see more and more of those examples. And building on what Cameron said, I think there has increasingly been a, a, a sort of perceived division between commercial and community led. And obviously commercial isn't always bad, but community led isn't always the best route because the community led drivers can often um, be perceived as sort of synonymous with volunteering is that it, generating ev any sort of revenue has a, a sort of a negative impact. But the fact is what happens then is that you get left with reliant on volunteers and everyone's already obscenely overworked, um, particularly in the mm. academic research sector. I know I have a lot of, of friends and colleagues in, in the UK uh, universities who are having ever more piled on their, their workload and then to expect them to lead community led 
without any form of remuneration. It's just not practical. People burn out. And, and then you, what you get is you have these great initiatives fail because people quite literally can no longer either support the time or support the, the sort of the physical and, and mental load because they're having to have a full-time job somewhere else. So I think a big part of the funding is that it does always have to be sustainable and sustainability for open science doesn't just mean, oh, everyone gets some, you know, it's not just the openness, it's it's how is it sustainable? How do we maintain it? So developing sort of profitable in a non-pejorative way, <laughs> business mm -hmm. models whereby enough money is made to allow the business, again, avoid, avoiding the pejorative terms associated with business, but allowing mm -hmm. those um, community-led initiatives to continue is incredibly important. Uh, because again, the money has to come from somewhere and the funders only have so much money and these these big initiatives can be great and they can get funding, but then at some point the money is going to stop and well, they can find a way to keep themselves exactly. going regardless. So my, my, Wait, where get... all the money comes from? Well, <laughs> you know, everyone's still working on, I think it's, as Cameron says, it's, we're not there quite yet, but I think recognising that financials are a, an important aspect yes. it's not just money you know financial grants it's not just funding it's got to be sustainable revenues have to come into it i think somewhere for some aspect so that it's not all freebies and volunteering absolutely and it's that sustainability of the open science open access publishing business model that is you know currently back front of center and and cameron talking about you know diversity in business models is really important because you know from a, a european and uk perspective the coalition s has you know driven the you know the incredible transformative deals from you know the the big publishers to a point where we've now had a review of coalition s's uh, uh, transformative uh, deals and you know, only 68% 68% of journals have failed to meet their targets in terms yeah. of the transformative targets and from next year, you know, de facto Coalition S will no longer fund an APC model. So the question is, how is this going to be sustained? And this sort of comes back to having innovation and diversity in the business model, in the access models. Uh, and I think that's you know, where you know, Zendi is, is also leading in terms of having an alternative you know, business model that's very attractive and then I, I think could be leveraged. Um, so, you know, it's clearly open science is developing very nicely in MENA. Um, uh, but Emily, in, in, in our last conversation, uh, you mentioned just for an example that coming from, I guess, again, maybe a European perspective, open science and implementation and, and, and working together that we tend not to think about the more practical aspects of, you know, developing open science in MENA. You mentioned that there's no globally accepted Lexis in Arabic for open science as an example, which, which makes it difficult then to to advance some some conversations. It'd be nice if you could maybe elaborate a bit more on that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's one of, I think, the most important initial working group projects we need to work on for the Forum for Open Research is really developing that um, conceptual lexicon so that we can start to um, expand the, the globalization. I mean, for example, take Twitter, or now we should probably call it X, but Twitter meant, yes. the word Twitter meant something completely different 10 years ago to the global thing. And now it means a, a specific product. The, the act of tweeting meant chirping like a bird, and now it means sending a short post. And that is a divergent but interesting example of what we've got right now here in the region, what we've discovered, we didn't realise initially, but we have discovered talking to all our various stakeholders um, and various um, sort of regional leaders in, in the field, is there is no regionally approved lexicon of terms relating to open science. The term open access has about 15 variations right now, all of which are variations of around, it get, often gets translated to something like liberal, as in with the connotations of political liberalism, and on the other hand, it's often translated as free. Now, neither of these is particularly accurate. And when one comes and tries to describe the concept, it people obviously don't understand. And the same goes across, it, it breeds misunderstandings, and, and misunderstanding can often, as we, we know from various uh, scenarios, can, mm. can breed mistrust. And so one of the first projects we're doing right now is to develop a lexicon. It might not, we're not going to force it on anyone, but we've got or in-house translators, and then we're just finalising the initial sort of 
50 terms that we think are the core ones, we'll be sending that out to our working group um, from across the region for their input. And then our hope is that at the very least, we'll have a standardized set of terms. We can always refine it later, but then at least there is a standard set of terms that we can help roll out and encourage the use of across all the different communities and, and different stakeholder groups with a view to then working collaboratively to imbue those meanings, those terms with the right meanings. Um, because obviously in, in the English language, it was pretty easy. We could just stick open as a word onto everything and that sort of worked. But even then the word open science didn't really mean anything to anyone. It's taken quite a few years for it to gain its meaning. And so we're sort of going to try and work on that. And then once that sort of core lexicon is, is established, we can then work on the next big project for us, which is obviously translating all of the available free resources that our, our partners are producing and, and kindly willing to let us uh, learn into Arabic and, and localizing them for our own communities, but also offering to provide translations for those other communities of their core work for their, their uh, maybe non-English speaking communities as well. Because so many of these organizations do, whether they realize it or not, and whether they engage directly or not, do have global audiences. So we want to facilitate the understanding across the board. Right. And, and the, that's a uh... Yeah, just just sharing that perspective, I mean, for me, was very enlightening because I hadn't considered that myself previously. And just so it's so important in terms of education and communicating, you know, open science that that's taken into consideration. But again, unless you have these conversations, these things tend not to surface. And mm -hmm. this is the great role that, you know, the forum is you know, creating is an opportunity to to share the, you know, the pain points and the, the challenges from uh, an Arabic perspective. Um, so uh, I do want to, to move on talk a little, a little bit about Zendi's as well and how that's that's growing and developing. Uh, so maybe Cameron, you can you can share a little bit more about uh, how things are going with Zendi. Definitely. So again, circling back to the previous question where we talked about reducing inequalities, uh, we want to level the, uh, the playing field, we um, really want to support lifelong learning, which is also one of the aims of, of, of open science. Uh, that's why Zendi was created, uh, to really, uh, after looking at all the issues and difficulties and challenges faced with uh, the access of scholarly literature, the idea was to really follow suit what has happened with various industries in order to bring uh, that content, make it discoverable, make it easy to find, and at the same time, make it affordable. I always use this example of you've got paid content, you've got open access content, you've got pirated content, why not have also affordable uh, content or affordable access? So at Zendi, this is what we are trying to trying to achieve. So we're we're trying to tackle the affordability, discoverability, and accessibility of scholarly literature. Now, what has happened since we started is, uh, of course, we, we started validating the business model in certain countries. We developed our own search engine, and we launched Zendi Open Worldwide. Now, uh, a year and a half after launching Zendi Open, I'm really happy to say that we've reached a quarter of a million uh, users from over 160 countries across the globe. Uh, and this is growing at a very fast pace. Uh, we are signing up uh, users on, on really rapid numbers on a day-to-day -day basis, which is, it, which is very exciting. And the content that is at the basis of this is open access and freely available content. So really helping with the discoverability, uh, get discoverability and accessibility. Now, the next step, you know, going back to the aim that we had with affordable access is to launch globally uh, the, the subscription model where you pay a subscription price, which is less than a single article that you would get on a pay-per-view uh, or paper per use model, and you have unlimited access to all the uh, uh, paywall content that is on the platform. Now, of course, the content that is available is as extendable of the publishers who sign up uh, to the initiative. But we're now super, super happy and excited that in September, we're launching the first global subscription option with a number of core publishers 
and this will av be available to every academic researcher, citizen, independent uh, 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 learner who usually has difficulty in accessing uh, scholarly literature. This will be available to, to, to everyone. And it's a huge breakthrough and it will be a huge milestone for Zendi. We did start this in certain regions where we are based. And of course, um, with, with various publishers, we've been testing it. And now we're finally excited to be able to launch this worldwide. Of course, what comes after it is to increase the number of, of publishers who also share the same vision and they would like to really uh, remove the, the barriers and make accessing paid or behind paywall uh, scientific and scholarly literature uh, affordable. Uh, so that would be our next step after the big launch. Of course, we're going to do a press release during Frankfurt Book Fair uh, the month after with the key partners that are, that are on board. But it's, it's, it's exciting times for Zendi that we're finally pushing out the business model that we've been talking about, and that's the affordable uh, access to literature. Following that, of course, with any platform, there's a lot of development plans, uh, like the launch of the application that would, would follow a Zendi app. We've done a lot of work on the AI side. Of course, a lot of people are now working or claiming uh, to have uh, uh, various AI elements. But one of our recent features that we uh, actually uh, announced was uh, an AI-based summarization which will assist in actually uh, going through a large amount of literature and having various articles summarized for you at the click of a button. So that's, that's is just a one simple uh, use of AI. We have language detection, AI-based uh, coming up would be subject uh, classification, again, AI-based. We're following more and more uh, on the recommendation and uh, of course, other plans as well that uh, we'll be announcing as it as it as it moves forward. But um, definitely, a lot of uh, a lot has happened with Zendi. We've came a long way. As I said, we've reached a quarter of a million uh, uh, users right now using the platform from around from over 160 countries, day in and day out, searching, downloading, uh, which is really proud for every. Uh, member of the team. Everyone's very excited to see all this development and the great feedback that we're receiving. But of course, the next big um, work that we'll be carrying out would be, of course, to uh, discuss and include more and more publishers into the business model, because the more publishers and the more an individual uh, uh, researcher, academic or lifelong learner can access uh, would make a better experience uh, on the platform and it will help them really identify and find what they're looking for. So exciting times, I would say. Very, very exciting. And, uh, you know, na naturally everybody's looking also to the integration of AI powered tools into every, every product and service while, whilst recognizing the limitations and trying to manage the, the hype, but it sounds like, you know, yeah, the tools that you just described there, are, you know, a perfect fit with with Zendi as it is in terms of making real a real difference to to the product, uh, and so obviously people can. Uh, uh, you you'll be in Frankfurt yourself, so people will be able to meet with you in Frankfurt. Um, Absolutely, and, yes. Um, yeah, so it's great great to see Zendi, you know, achieving these milestones and developing to, you know. Uh, a great success because I know how how much you've uh, you know invested in that and supported that over the years. So you know it's now coming to fruition, which is which is great. Uh, yeah, I thought of course we it might... takes time, but eventually you get oh, yeah. there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Everything takes time. Uh, yeah. So I thought we might might just finish up. Also, I know you're you you're passionate also about the Knowledge Foundation. It might be nice to hear a little bit about what the foundation's doing currently and and in the future. Of course, well, of course, the biggest thing that the foundation is involved in is the support for Forum, and we're quite excited about that. And in addition to that, uh, most of the company are contributing and, and supporting, uh, with really um, managed by by Emily, which is she's she's what she's created is is really fantastic and amazing, really uh, to make to be able to make that difference. More than that, the foundation, we're also planning uh, one our next school project, which is going to be in Nepal this time, 
and we have a large group from the company that we're actually going to take part in the in the building of the school and that's uh straight after frankfurt after forum uh after a busy i'm very sad i can't go because <laughs> i have form stuff sadly I'm really upset mm. <laughs> yeah it'll, it'll be uh, after a busy uh, two weeks uh, and a large part of the company will be uh, flying over to to nepal to be able to take part in the, in the, in the school project and it's of course it's really um taking education where it's most needed some places we're talking about technology we're talking about discovery in some places it's just the bricks and mortar and a place to be able to to to, to, to gather mm. and for teachers mm. to uh, to commune and to be able to really provide that basic education so the needs and the requirements are different from from part to part uh, from place to place and uh, the whole aim is uh, of the foundation is like where you to really take it to places where it cannot be reached uh, traditionally. So that's something big that is coming up uh, from 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 the foundation. And also on on that note, talking about you know sort of back coming back to the sort of open science, mm. the foundation is also one of the funders for the directory of open access journals, um, and is also will be launching its own uh, journal uh, later this year to provide a, a forum for both the research produced during the annual forum itself, but also more generally, apologies, mm. a bilingual journal to publish Arabic language as well as English language research about the development and implementation of open science policies and practices in this region. Because again, this is part of building up that sort of wider accessibility thing is we, we, we realized there needed to be a journal for people to find ideas to find research to exchange ideas uh, and and outside just the annual forum we felt that there needed to be um a publication as well to preserve that information um and make it accessible on a global scale so your your, your focus is the forum for uh in you know, october how 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 can people get involved at this stage you know it's only a few months leading up are there uh, well, ways in which it, people can get involved Yes, no, we, we have, um, obviously we would like everyone to come in person. Abu Dhabi is lovely at that time of year, <laughs> I say, sounding like I'm speaking for the tourism board. Um, so it, we, we obviously would very much appreciate and, and love to welcome people who wish to come. Um, there is an early bird discount currently, so registration fee is just $130 if you wish to join us. And that's available on, on our website, uh, which is www forumforopenresearch.com, I need to remember that. But also we are, this will be a hybrid event, so we will be offering uh, free online access for anyone who wants to attend uh, online, because again, it is all about accessibility and we do want to make sure that the ideas that are exchanged uh, reach as wide an audience as possible and, and get to, to where they need to be. So again, um, closer to the time, we'll be releasing an online registration option as well on the website. And also everything will be recorded um, and all the presentations will be preserved in Zenodo as well. So there's a lot of ways for people to either join us on the day or follow up and, and see what's happening afterwards, including hopefully reading some of the articles in the channel. And I assume you've got corporate sponsors as well? Um, we do also, yes, we have some sponsors. Uh, Cameron mm. can probably answer that bit. <laughs> and you would like some more? We're definitely, we're looking to. <laughs> yeah, awesome. definitely, as always. It's it's a non for profit initiative, and uh, we've supported it as much as possible through the foundation. But there's only a limit, mm. to, like everything. So, uh, the more uh, publishers and providers can contribute towards uh, mm. this this movement towards this this goal, uh, even policymakers. Uh, that would definitely be welcome. As I said, this does not belong to us. It belongs to the region and it belongs to um, uh, the movement. And we are just kickstarting. We're trying to initiate it. We're trying to support it. But at the end of the day, it belongs to the community. So the more support we can get from the community, we can make it uh, sustainable, make it more affordable for individuals. For example, one of the things that we've tried to do is like really with the delegation fees, it's just basically to cover the costs. If you've ever yes. been involved in any events, you would know how much it costs <laughs> per delegate mm. uh, to be able to, to, to have all those facilities uh, available. So really, it's just like uh, covering costs. So in order to be able to, to make the program um, as, as unique and as beneficial to everyone as possible, we'll need all the support that we 
that we can get from the from the community. So definitely uh, more sp sponsorship would be uh, welcome. And uh, as I said, it's it belongs to the community. So uh, we 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 will need everyone's support to uh, to turn this into 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 a success. And that's a, a, ni a nice way to, to finish our conversation. Thank you both so much. Thank you, Emily and, and Cameron, for a great conversation. I'm, it's so pleasing to see the, the, the forum developing in leaps and bounds from when we did, discussed it last year in advance of it happening. Um, and obviously great to see you know, Zendi you know, being equally successful. Uh, so I wish you both great success with everything you're doing this year. I'll make sure I include links to all the mentions in our conversation, and particularly to, to the form uh, and the contact details for both of you, for people who, who wish to uh, contact you directly. But for the moment, Emily, Cameron, thank you so much for your conversation and uh, we'll meet again soon. Thank you, thank you very thank much, you. Martin.